Hello and welcome to this course on building your first glass team for your web design projects. The goal of this course is to help you create the nicest looking glass footer which you can use later in all your projects. In this course, we'll learn everything you need to know in order for you to understand all that we are doing. Simply, you do not need to know anything about HTML5 or CSS3. You just need to watch and learn. I created this course to get you inspired and motivated, given that I quit so many times when I was starting out because I was learning a lot yet producing very poor designs. The whole journey became boring and exhausting. No doubt you will face it when you begin, but we can avoid this if we first build a very nice project and then with that strong sense of accomplishment, we will then be motivated to learn anything and I mean anything web design and development. I know the promo video says it all. So let's take a look at what we'll be building in this course. It is a very cool looking footer which has lots of awesome features. It uses CSS transitions and animations and simply there is nothing else like this guys. First of all, we'll learn how to use the text editors where we'd even get deeper into sublime text plugins that will help us speed up our workflow tremendously. Next, I'll teach you the very basic yet the most useful parts of HTML5 and CSS3. When we are up and running, we'll put all that we have learned into making the greatest glass footer ever. Additionally, I'll give you a very cool bonus lecture that will get you more excited. After all this, what next? Yes, we are done. That's all. A course designed to motivate you need not be lengthy, but very clear, concise and fun. Note however, that I'll be taking my time to talk, hence you are free to increase the playback speed. To sum up this lecture, let's get the ball rolling. Thanks for taking this course and I will see you in the next video. Bye. Hello and welcome to the second video in this series. In this video, we are going to take a look at text editors. So what is a text editor? A text editor is a software that we use to write text, just like the one we have right here. Now these advanced text editors are also good for writing code, but then the major purpose of this advanced text editors is for writing codes and not for writing just normal text. So they come with some form of advanced features that help us to highlight recognized syntax like we can see here. All keywords have some unique kind of color coding and so many other features like line indentation, a general preview and some other cool stuff that we'll get into in a short while. So if a Windows user Basically, what we will be using in this course is Sublime Text. It's also a very powerful text editor and I prefer it to other text editors for some good reasons. That doesn't mean the other text editors are not good, but I just like this. Sublime Text also works on the Mac, so let's go ahead and take a look at how we can install Sublime Text on our PC on our Mac. First, we need to visit this website, sublimetext.com, where we can get to download either a paid version or we can get a free trial version to use just for the purpose of this course. Secondly, if you do not want to spend money on a text editor just yet, you can try some free alternatives like Notepad++. To get Notepad++, you just have to visit this website and then come down to the download button and download a free version for use. Next, if you're a Mac user, you can also try TestMate which is a very cool one too for development. Now, if you want something that is very similar to Sublime Text, but you want it for free, you can also try Atom. Atom is a very powerful text editor, which comes with lots and lots of features, just like Sublime Text. It comes with additional plugins to extend its functionality as well. I like Atom very much just because of their themes. So that is basically about it for this video. In the next video, we are going to take a look at how to work with Sublime Text and install some basic plugins that will enhance our workflow. Thank you very much and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to the third video in the series. In this video, we are going to go deep into Sublime Text plugins. Now I'm assuming that you just got your Sublime Text downloaded and installed, so you can go ahead and launch it. When you launch Sublime Text, your version may not necessarily look like mine because I have changed my team, but every feature should be the same. So what is the Sublime Text plugin? Sublime Text plugin is an add-on that extends the functionality of Sublime Text. In this video, we are going to take a look at how to install three of Sublime Text's most essential plugins. The first of all is Autosave. 
What does autosave do? If I go ahead and create a new file with Control N and then I type something, what we can see is that this file is not saving as we type. We may have to go to File, Save, and then save this file. Or we can equally use the Control S on the keyboard to save the file. But what if we want to save as we type? Now, that is where autosave comes in handy. With autosave, all that we have to do as developers is to edit and write our code. We don't need to use the control S any longer because the plugin will be saving as we type. So let's just go ahead and see how we can install the plugin. To install autosave, just like any other Sublime Test plugin, the first place we have to visit is the control package or the package control. To launch package control, hold down on control shift and P if you're a Windows user and type install package. Then you wait for the repository to load and then you search for the package that you want, which in this case is autosave. Then we wait for it to install and then we learn how we can use it next. Well, now that we have it installed, the next thing is to learn how we can use the autosave plugin. To use the autosave plugin, first we are going to create a new file and then we are going to name this file or save the file as try.html. Now the next thing after saving the file is to save or turn on autosave. To turn on autosave, all you have to do as a Windows user is to hold down on Control Shift and S. And as you can see the indication here, we have autosave on. Now, when we type anything, we can just relax and have the plugin save for us, as we can see with the blue indication right here. So that is just about it for autosave. And it's good to know that this autosave plugin is going to help us as we begin the coding of the footer, because it's going to reduce the amount of time that we have to use our keyboard. Now, the next plugin that we are going to use is Advanced New File Plugin. What does Advanced New File Plugin do? The Advanced New File Plugin just helps us to create files more dynamically and more intelligently. What do I mean? I can hold down Control N to create a single file. But what if I want to create a file and also I want to create a folder and store that file in that folder at the same time? With the Advanced New File Plugin, I do not have to involve File Explorer at all. But without it, I may have to first of all click here, then I have to go to new file or find a way of creating a new folder in my project directory. But what if a plugin can just do that for us by both creating a folder and a file? And that is what the advanced new file plugin does. So let's go ahead and install it. Just like any other plugin, we hold down Control Shift and P, type install package as usual, wait for it to load, then we type advanced new file. Just like this wait for the one to install also and then we learn how to use it okay now that we have it installed let's learn how to trigger it to trigger the advanced new file plugin all that we have to do is to hold down on Control alt and n then we have an option to create a new file or a folder with a path so what if we wanted to create a folder called php and in that folder we want to create a file called index.php all that we have to do is to type in php forward slash index.php just like so enter and then we get an error now this error is because we are not currently working in any directory so the sublime test does not know where to create the folder and the file so we are going to go ahead and then choose a working directory or first open the folder like so this way we can go ahead and trigger our new file plugin then type the name of the folder we want to create as in PHP, then forward slash index dot PHP, enter, and then we have it. So when we get back to the sidebar, which shows us all our folders, we can see that we have a PHP folder and then we have an index page within it. So that is pretty much it for the advanced new file plugin. Now, the next plugin that I want us to study is Emmet. What does Emmet do? Emmet is a plugin that will help us to write less and do more. We can just write a very simple syntax and then expand it to its full value. Let me demonstrate that. To demonstrate that, I'm going to go ahead and first remove this from the project so we have a clear area to work with. Then I'm going to create a new file and call this index.php. Okay, now in this index.php, 
normally when we are working with HTML, which I don't want you to think about the details of it now, what we will have to do is to first declare a document type. The document type actually tells the browser the version of HTML we are using and some details about the page, whether it's going to use a French language or English language, all those things. We declare them in the document type. Now for HTML5, we declare a document type this way by typing in document type HTML followed by HTML tag. Then we can now give it a head, maybe a title and etc and etc. But what if there was a way to just write less and expand it to this full block of code? And that is what Emmet does. By the help of Emmet, we can just use a very simple exclamation mark and then expand it to that full value. Now, is it for only doc type declarations? No. For almost everything, HTML and probably some other languages as well. So just like any other plugin, we are going to use the package control, install package, wait for it to load, then we search for Emmet. Well, we are not going to see Emmet here with my installation because I already have Emmet installed. But if you don't have Emmet installed with your Sublime Test version, then it should be here. We have some other variations, but this is not what I need. Once I have it installed, let's go ahead and learn how to use it. Some few seconds ago, we just learned how to declare doc type. But what if I can just make the process a little bit easier? I will just use an exclamation mark and then press the tab on my keyboard and get a full doc type declaration. This is just how easy it can get with Emmet. So now that we've studied how to use these three plugins, I'll see you in the next video where we are going to take a look at Sublime Test Project, working with project files. Thank you very much and bye. Hi, and welcome to the fourth lecture in this series. In this video, we're going to take a look at how to work with Sublime Test Project. But before we even get into that, I want us to explore this cool feature by going to view, sidebar, and then show sidebar. Here we can see all the files that we are working with in our project. So now that we are done with that, let's get into the project. What is a Sublime Test project? A Sublime Test project is actually what we are working on as a developer. Whatever you're working on as a developer is termed a project. Now in Sublime Text, when you configure your development environment like this with all the files opened and the plugins installed and all that, you can save that as a project. When you go to project and then you move to save, you're supposed to pick a directory where you can save this. But I would prefer to save it in the directory that we are going to save the other working files. So I will just scroll down here and I'm expecting to see in document a folder called glass footer. Or if it's not there, let's just go ahead and create this new folder. And we're going to call this glass footer files like this. Good. Then we're going to open this folder and then save our sublime project. So we're going to call this glass footer project. And then it comes with its own extension. So you, you don't need an extension for this. I'll save this. And the first thing we can see upon save is that the title bar has changed to reflect the new project. Now that we are working in this project, I want us to go ahead and bring in some files into the project. So I'm going to click on the file tab, open folder, then I'm going to open the folder that we just created, glass footer files, select folder, and then a new window opens for us. So we can go ahead and close the other window. And as we can see in the new file that we just, or the folder that we just brought into the project, it has one file and that is the sublime project file that we have just created. The project file can help us to easily launch the entire project. Without first opening the text editor, we can just go ahead and move to that directory in documents. Then we open it like so, and there we have it. And that is just about it for this video. Thank you and I'll see you in the next video where we begin the basics of HTML5. Hello and welcome to the fifth lecture in this series where we're going to start talking about HTML basics. Before we begin with the basics of HTML, I want us to go ahead and create a folder called text where we'll be putting all our text files. And also we are going to name this file index.html. So we'll begin first by launching our advanced new file plugin. Then we create a folder called test like this. Then 
and it will be index.html. Good. So as we can see visually, we now have a folder called test. Then in the folder, we have index.html. Now, the first thing you do when you're working with an HTML document is to declare a document type. A doc type declaration just tells the browser the version of HTML you're using and it gives it more information about the page or the web document you're working with. That is in a very basic sense. So to declare a document type, I'm just going to use my Emmet to do this and then I'll explain what is actually happening on the page. Now first is a document type declaration this way and we call this a tag in HTML. Everything that looks like a less than and a greater than and with a content inside of it is a tag in HTML. Now we have opening tags and closing tags. Some of the tags have opening tags and closing tags. This is an example of a tag that does not have a closing tag. But if we take a look at the head tag, we can see that the head tag has a close tag. Close tags are written with a forward slash before the word in itself. And our meta tags just give more information ab about the page to either search engines or the browser or third party applications. The title tag is a tag that we can see visually or whatever we write in between this can be seen visually on the browser's tab or title tab. So I'm just going to write basics of HTML here. Then I'll save this, turn on my auto save and also go ahead and open it in the browser. And as you can see that for this demonstration, I'm using Mozilla Firefox Developer Edition, which matches perfectly with the theme that I'm using for my Sublime Text. Now, back to the title tag, we can see the title right here, and that is the function of what we have written in the title tag. If we change this, then we should expect this to change as well. We should, however, take note that because we are targeting a project or this course is basically about getting you up and running without first exposing you to a lot of things to learn which makes everything boring. We will not be covering everything because loading yourself with too much information in the beginning is actually what gets people to quit this whole thing. So we are just going to study the tags and the codes that will be very very essential to the footer that we will be developing at the end of the day. So that said, let's get down to this body tag. What does this body tag do? Well, but then before we even talk out about the body tag, let's just talk a little about the HTML tag. The HTML tag just tells the browser that whatever we write in between it is going to be an HTML or a set of HTML codes. And then it has language here, which tells us that the codes will be in English and not any other language. Now to the body tag. As we can see that when we head back to the browser, we can't see anything displayed on the page as, as of this moment. Now, the purpose of the body tag is to hold everything that we are writing on the page. The things that we can see as users of the system or viewers of the website, all those things will be written inside the body tag. Now, before we continue, I want us to talk about HTML commenting. What is a comment? Comments are made for developers to easily remember portions of code. So if I'm developing, I can choose to put a comment of how maybe I did something at a section so that later when I'm reading the code, I can remember that, oh, okay, this is what I did here. So to comment in HTML, you first begin with the less than, then with your exclamation mark, four dashes in the middle this way, then you close it this way. Now you write everything, anything that you write after the first two dashes becomes your comment, okay? And this cannot be rendered by the browser. The browser does not actually render this. It sees it as non-relevant and it can only be read by the human being who is reading the code. When we begin with the basics of CSS2, we will learn how to comment in CSS. HTML is a markup language in the sense that it's not actually a programming language which that can create too much logic. So we use it to format a document. That said, in formatting a document, we sometimes come across terms like paragraphs, spans, divs and all that, divs, sections, articles and all that. And trust me, those things can be found here in HTML as well. Some of these tags come with default styles and some do not come with default styles. So for example, the paragraph like this comes with some sort of default 
style. What if I write in between these two paragraphs become the visible object on the page? So if I went ahead to write this is the first paragraph and save this, go ahead to the browser and refresh, we should see something like this is the first paragraph. Good. Now what if I went ahead and then I'll, I copied this and then paste it for the second time? By this time, I'm just going to change the content to this is the second paragraph and refresh. All we can see is that the second paragraph is beginning on a new line, which is even telling us that there's some sort of formatting. As we can see, there is a, a space in between them. When we begin learning about how to style our HTML documents with CSS, we'll get to appreciate all these things about paddings and margins that come with some tags. Now from paragraphs, the next thing I want us to take a look at is the div. Divs are just generic elements that help us to create content on the page. Now divs don't necessarily come with any default styles like border or things that are visually appealing. They are just rectangular boxes which in the beginning do not have any style. So if I went ahead to refresh my page, you can see that the div is not showing but it's there. It's not showing because it does not have a content. But what if we give it the content of this is the first div. Save this document and then we refresh the page. We can see this is the first div. Now all HTML tags are rectangular boxes on the page. If we want to see this visually, we can do it when we get to the CSS section of the course. And in this course, we would be using divs a lot. The next is a span. The span tag, just like the div, is also a generic element, just that the span tag is an inline element and not a block level element. Inline elements are elements that can be written in one line, whereas the block level elements are elements that need to be on a fresh line each time they are called into play. But in, with the help of CSS, we can even change inline elements to block level elements and block level elements to inline elements. So as we can see, the paragraphs are block level elements in the sense that after the first paragraph, declaring the second paragraph, this one pushed it down here because it's already occupying from here to here if it's a rectangular box on the page. Also, divs are block level elements. But what if we give the span a content? This is the first span. And then we save this move to the next line. Now this very first span is showing on the next line because the div has pushed it down. The div already has occupied the space here. But what if we go ahead and declare second span and just change the content to second span. Refresh our browser. As you can see this does not begin on a new line but it's still on the same line giving us the impression that this is an inline element. Now moving away from spans, we want to treat the footer tag. The footer tag is also a generic tag but makes semantic sense or it has some sort of semantic to it. It, it. it makes logical sense in development. The work of the footer tag can also be done by the div tag and some other tags. But when you are writing your code, you can see that later when you are reading, you can come to this block and say, oh, okay, this is my footer section of the document. So let me just go ahead and give this a content. This is the first footer. Then we go ahead to refresh the browser and still we have another new element. So given that we have covered some few tags in this section, we'll leave the other tags for the next video. Thank you very much and see you in the next video. Hi and welcome to the SIT lecture in this series. In this lecture, we're going to take a look at the list tag or the unordered list tag. In working with the ordered list tag, the first thing we do is to declare the unordered list block. Then in the unordered list block, we have list items. Now this list items hold whatever we want to declare as a list. So I can say this is my first item. And then we head back to the browser and perform a quick refresh. So we can see that the list item comes with some default styles, which we can remove by the use of CSS. Now let's copy this and repeat it for a few times and see what happens. 
So heading back to the browser, we can just perform a refresh. And upon refresh, we can see that the list items just keep repeating with the same style. Now, this list items become so useful when we are developing the footer. The various tabs on the footer are list items. So that said, I'll see you in the next video where we are going to take a look at linking the style sheet document to HTML. Thank you. Bye. Hi, and welcome to the seventh video in this series where we're going to learn about HTML and style sheets. Now, CSS style sheets or CSS is used to style HTML element. So the first thing we have to do is to get an element. And in this video, I'm going to use the div tag. With CSS, normally what we do is to either change one property of the tag that we have selected or more than one property of the tag. The property could be the border or the font size, the color and what have you. But before we can efficiently work with CSS and HTML, we are supposed to know how to effectively include the CSS into our document. The first way that we can include CSS in our HTML is by the use of the style property that comes with the individual element. Now, if I appended a style property here and say change the color to either green and went ahead to give the div a content, say my first div. When I head back to my browser and perform a quick refresh, I'm expecting to see a green content on the screen. What if I went ahead to give it more styles like say the font size and change this to say 100 pixel. Get back to my browser and perform a refresh. As we can see that the font is bigger than it used to be. Now this is just one way of adding CSS to the HTML document. But as you can tell that doing it this way could get a little bulky if we had so many styles to give. So one very nice way of changing things around is to use an internal style sheet by first declaring a style block in the head section of your document. Then by the help of CSS selectors, we can select the individual element that we want to effect change on and then we style it to our specification. So the first selection that I'm going to do will be an, I'll use an element selector by just selecting the div this way. Since it is the only div that we have on the whole page, then we are going to change the color property to green. And then we're going to change the font size to, this time around we are going to give it 200 pixel. So we expecting this to be bigger when we refresh. And then it works as suspected. But also using the internal style sheets could be could make our whole document become very large if we had lots of styles that we want to apply to different different elements. So the next way that we are going to use CSS is by the use of an external style sheet. External style sheets have to be linked to the HTML document by using the link tag. And then we set a relationship or the relation to the page which is a style sheet then the next thing we want to do is to set a location or we want to give it a directory where it can find a file now we do not have a CSS file so let's use the advanced new file plugin to create one Control alt and n then we create a folder called CSS followed by a style.css file and as we can see this has been created for us dynamically CSS and we can find that file However, to effectively navigate to the CSS file, we need to understand how to work with relative parts and absolute parts in HTML. Relative parts are just a way of defining a part by the use of, or by with reference to the current working directory. So as you can see, I'm working in a folder called test. And to get to the folder called CSS, I must first move back to my root folder. And to do that, I'm going to use two dot then forward slash, which tells the browser to move back once to the root working directory, then move to a folder called CSS. And in the CSS folder, we have to find a file called style.css. 
to prove that this works let's go ahead and change the style of the element div but before then we want to perform a refresh in the browser so that we do not have any style at the moment now the first thing I want to do here is to first select as usual then next I want to change the border and then I'm going to set the border to 5 pixel in size then I'm going to make it a solid border and I'll change the color to red go ahead and then I refresh the browser to see if the change has really taken effect so as we can see the border has been changed to red and then we have a 5 pixel size border but then you remember what I said about HTML elements being rectangles on the page this is a vivid example of it as you can see this is a rectangular box on the page and once it is a rectangular box we can apply other styles to change the shape so that is pretty much it with HTML and linking CSS document the, in the next video we are going to take a look at how to work with selectors thank you and I'll see you in the next video hi and welcome to the eighth video in this series in this video we're going to demonstrate how to use the other type of selectors selectors such as IDs classes and descendant selectors now from the previous videos you can see right here that this is an example of an element selector but we can equally select this element by the use of either an ID or a class while element selectors could work great the problem with element selectors is that if we have this div and then we have multiple divs on the same page then that means that the style that we write here would affect all the other divs on the page and I tell you that is not something that you want so you should try as much as possible to stay away from element selectors as you can so I'm just going to go ahead and then clean this and identify this uniquely by appending an ID to the beginning tag and then I'll give this ID a name of say my first div now you do not have to necessarily use the underscores but for the purpose of easy reading I normally use underscore to separate my words when even naming variables in programming so I'm just going to go ahead and copy this head back to the CSS document and then I'm going to grab it this way and then change some properties of the element say first the font size of the element I'm going to set this to 200 pixel and try to refresh my browser as you can see that upon refresh the font size of the element has not changed and that is because we made a problem with the selection we are selecting as an element and not as an ID to make this an ID all we have to do is to append a hashtag in front of it this way get back to the document and then perform the refresh and this way we have it now one thing to know about ID selectors is that the ID that we give to this right here can be unique to only that thing okay we cannot repeat that ID anywhere or give it to a different element meaning that this style can only be applied to this right here what if we want to give this style to more than one element on the page that calls for a different type of selector known as the class selector so to demonstrate a class selector let's just go ahead and input more divs on the page my second div I'm gonna copy this repeat it a few times and change the inscription say my third and fourth div this way when I head back to my browser and refresh as we can see that these two things here do not have the or these few divs do not have any style yet so even before we do the class selection let me just go ahead and give them the same ID and see what happens so while it's looking like it's working fine this is not technically approved and you are not supposed to do it so let's just get back to the class selection now to use a class all that you have to begin with is the class keyword this way 
and then you name this uniquely say div class this is just an example you give it the name that fits best the class that you're declaring so I'm just going to copy this class name here and then I'm going to select the class this way and then I'll change the color of all elements that belong to the same class say I'm changing the color to red now when we head back to the browser and perform a refresh we can see that the color has not changed right and that is because we have a problem with the class selection classes begin with full stops or periods so this time that we fix the period let's just go ahead and refresh the browser okay as we can see that a class or this very element has changed its column we can equally go ahead and then copy the class and give it to all the other elements that we want them to have the same style alright so as we can see all elements that belong to this class have the same color now one thing you should know is to never repeat the same identification for more than one element it will give you problems as you go along even though it shows that it's some way somehow working use class to style elements that you want them to have the same style now that we've seen how to select by element name ID and class I want us to take a look at what a descendant selector is so first of all all that I'm going to do is to clean this and then begin with my divs again ID first div then inside this div I want to declare something like a paragraph and I'm going to copy this whole thing right here and I'm going to repeat it once more this way I'll call this my second div but then I'm just going to leave this paragraph right where it is so first of all let me give this paragraph a content say I am the first paragraph or the first B then I'm going to give this paragraph a name or a content say I am the second paragraph now let's head back to our browser and perform a refresh as we can see we have two paragraphs here first paragraph and second paragraph when we head back to the CSS section of our document we can perform descendant selecting of this first paragraph and style it with different styles whereas this paragraph will remain untouched so let's see how we can do that first of all we're going to grab the first div by its ID this way then down one level we are going to search for the paragraphs inside that div so as we can see there is a div called first div then we have a paragraph in it if you remember from element selectors under normal circumstance if this was not a descendant selection you can see that all the piece on the page should be changing per the style that we will be describing here but see what happens when we change the font size upon refresh we can see that the second P has not changed but the first P has changed and that is because the second P does not belong to the first div or is not a child of the first div so if we want to go ahead and select the second paragraph to what we have to do is to select the second div okay in this case and do it this way and then we're going to change this to second div then the paragraph that is a descendant of the second div and we are going to change its font size to something that is even smaller than the first one say 100 pixel and we can see the difference right here okay so as we can see that descendant way of selecting works now there are more advanced ways of selecting an element by the use of pseudo classes and all that but trust me we do not need that in this course we are not going to use it in the development of the footer so it is not important to us in this course so given that we've studied some basic ways of selecting in CSS I'll see you in the next video thank you very much hi and welcome to the ninth video in this series in this video we're going to take a look at working with the basics of CSS where we'll be treating height width border and border radius color background image and types of CSS color values
So let's get right into it. As we can tell from the previous videos that working with TSS is all about changing the properties of element. First of all, let's give an element to work on. And then we are going to identify this element uniquely by an ID, say my first div, so first div this way. Then we are going to give this a content of I am the first div. So now in the style sheet document, we're just going to select the division first div and begin to change the CSS properties. The first of which will be height. And then the height, I want us to give it 40 pixel. Now, what is about this pixel? Pixel is just a way of measuring values. Just like how we have centimeters and inches and all that. Pixels is just a way of measuring values when working with CSS. We have other types of measurements like percentages and EMs, EM, which you can take a look at really if you want to learn more about measurements in CSS. But for the purpose of this course, we are just going to use percentages and pixels. So now that we've changed the height of the element, let's go ahead and see how it looks like in the browser. As we can see, even though the height of the element has changed, it is not about the height of the text, but the element itself, okay? I mean the rectangular box. So we can't really visually see that. That is because we do not have any background image or background color. So let's go ahead and give it some sort of background. I'm just going to set the background to say green. Then we head back and refresh this. And as we can see that we now have a background to this whole thing. So the next thing I want us to do is to actually change the height property and see that it is really working in effect. 140 pixels, refresh the browser, and we see that we have a higher banner or we have a higher division. The next thing I want us to talk about is the width of the division or the element. Now the width is the span, how far it goes across the page and that is the width. To change the width, we just have to give it the value that we want by after we have selected the width property, then we give it the value. So I'm just going to set this to 50% since I talked about percentages. Let's just set this to 50% of the entire page and see what happens. Refresh and we have 50% of the entire page given that the page already or the HTML element has some sort of margin around it. Okay which we are going to reset by the help of something we call a reset style sheet. We'll talk about that later in the course. Now, the next thing I want us to talk about is the border. Okay. The border is actually a line that we see at the edge or after the content of the document or the element itself. So the border, I want to set this to one pixel in size. Then I want it to be solid in nature and then I'm going to give it a color, say red. So as we can see, we now have a red tin border here, but we can equally change the size of the border, maybe say to 10 pixels, and then perform a refresh and see what happens. Okay, so now we have a bigger border. What I want to do is to invert the colors. So I'm going to change this to pink, and then I'll change the border to green instead, so that we can have a more visually pleasing object on the page. Head back and perform a refresh and I think this looks better. Okay. Now we can equally change the the look of the edge right here or the corners. We can change the look of the corners by the border radius property. And then we're just going to set this thing to five pixel. So as we can see that this now has a more rounded corner which looks beautiful compared to what we had first. But one thing we have to know about borders is that now when you decide to add a border to your element, the height or and the width of your element changes. So if this had a 40 pixel height and maybe a 50 pixel height in the beginning, after giving this a 10 pixel border, it's going to increase the height and the and the width by 10 each so if the height was 40 it becomes 50 and if the width was 50 it becomes 60. by the way we can use css to turn that off but we are not going to use that in this course 
Now the next property is the color property where we get to change the color of the text itself and then we are just going to set the color of this very text to yellow okay and we perform a refresh and we can see that the color of the text itself has changed to yellow now I want us to look at changing the font weight where we can tell if we wanted the font to be thin or either bold okay I'm just gonna set this to bold and then upon refresh I'm expecting to see a text that looks bolder okay bigger right okay that has taken effect next we can also change the font size to see 20 pixel and then this looks bigger now now as we can see with the color values that we are using here there are different types of CSS colors we can use the very common color names like say green pink yellow red and have it change the color also we can use hexadecimal numbers say E3 or E33 and then let's go ahead and refresh and see what happens okay well you can see that the border has changed to red so E33 in essence is color red but then you need to begin with a hashtag or we can equally use an RGB color value just like so now the RGB color value specifies the red green and then the black color right so if we set this thing to value say 23 54 and say 22 what we are doing is we are mixing colors we are mixing red green and black to give us some sort of unique color let's see what that gives us oh that is pretty nice color right so the next thing that I want us to do is just to append an A or an alpha channel to this now if we appended an alpha channel what we can do is that we can change the transparency or the opacity of the color how well we want this to show on the page so we can make it a little bit transparent this has a value ranging from 0 to 1 0 meaning 0 transparency or opacity you don't want it to be opaque at all you don't want to see anything so let's just give zero and see what happens see we cannot actually see it even though it is there so let's change this thing to point say five right halfway the transparency and see that the border looks a lot thinner guys this is the real trick about changing or the glass feel that we are going to get with the footer that we have the footer that we have right here okay and as we can see too that the footer renders very well in different browsers even though there are lots and lots of browser inconsistencies this is google chrome and then we can equally open this in mozilla firefox by just copying the web address and then bring it in here paste and go and then we have it here equally working perfectly All right but as we can see from here we have something like an image right this is a background image so how do we include a background image in our document first of all we get back to our code and then we specify that we want to change the background image dash image just like so and then we write the URL or the location where the background image can be found this is normally a string value so we have to find a background picture and then give it the directory name for us to find the background and since this is our project directory or we are working with the project files I'm just going to create a folder called images so now that we have a folder called images we can go ahead and include a file in this image directory I'm just going to look for a file and then put it in this folder and then as we can see now we have a background picture or a picture that we will be using for the entire project so now the next thing is to find the directory where it can be found as we can see we are working in the CSS folder as of now or the style sheets file so we have to first move back once and enter the images folder where we can find the image file so we're just going to move back once then we enter the images folder where we can find the file called bg dot and it's a jpeg file that we are using so let's go ahead and refresh the browser or open this right in our browser and see what happens 
So we can see that we have just included a background image to the HTML elements right here. So guys, given that we've studied height, background, width, border, border radius, color, font weight, font size, background image, we would meet in the next video where we're going to go more into more advanced topics in CSS. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome back to this episode where we're going to talk about how to remove the default styles that come with the list item. So first we're going to declare a list item and then give it the content of first item. Save this and open it in our browser. As we can see that we have a list item with a bullet point. Okay, that is a default style that comes with list items. But what if we want to remove this? All that we have to do is head back to the style section of our document and then grab the list item that we want and change the list style to none. Save this and then head back to browser refresh and there we have it now that we are done removing the bullet point let's look at how we can remove the padding and the margin from the list item okay to do that we can just append the padding to zero and then the margin to the margin to zero as well okay but this is not going to work for a reason let's go ahead and refresh this this is not working because the list item is also in another element called the UL element or the unordered list. So the padding and the margin, if we want to default it to zero, we have to apply that to the unordered list and not the list item itself. So let's go ahead and try that and see what happens. So instead of this, we're just going to grab the entire UL. The entire UL and in this way, set its padding and margin to zero and see what happens okay so as we can see the effect has taken place and that is pretty much it for this video i'll see you in the next video thank you hi and welcome to the 11th video in this series in this video we're going to take a look at working with css text shadows and box shadows so judging from my document structure you can see that I already have some basic setup where I've declared a division and then I have an ID to it. And also in my CSS document, I've already selected the ID to make things a little faster. First of all, I want us to give the division a content. As usual, I'm the first div. And then we are going to set a height for the div where we're going to give it just 40 pixel. Next, we want to set width to 50%. And then we are going to just refresh the browser and see what happens. Okay. So like, let's give a background color of say pink. And see how well this is doing on the page. Okay. So we can see that our style is really working. Now, before we continue, I want to introduce you to something we call padding. What if we want to give some space around the content itself and not the space around the whole element to do that we use the padding property so we can just come to our document and then give a level of padding say 5 pixel head back refresh and we should see some space you should also know that the padding property increases the total or the final height and width of the respective element so in doing your calculations, if you really wanted this to be 40 pixels at the end of the day, and you know you'll be given a padding to both top and bottom, then the net should be 30 pixels. So that when five pixels is added to the top and five pixel is added to the bottom, the net or the total at the end will be 10 pixels here plus 10, 30 pixels giving you 40 pixels. And that renders back to the 40 pixels that you intended on getting at the beginning. What we have done here, however, is called a shortcut or short hunt. We can specify a pattern for only the top section of the element or the top part of the content of the element, or we can set it for the left, the right, or the bottom. But we are just concerned with 
padding in general. So the next thing I want us to do is to give some sort of text shadow. Okay. Now to give it a text shadow, the first value you have to specify is the horizontal shadow value. And in this case, we're just gonna give it one pixel horizontal value. Then as we give it a two pixel vertical value. Then the next thing is to specify a distance, how wide we want the shadow to go. So in this case, I'm just gonna give five pixel wide. Then what color do we want the shadow to have? Let's say red, so E33 in this case. Let's go ahead and refresh this and see what happens. Okay, so as we can see that we now have some sort of red shadow around the text itself. What if we want that red shadow on the entire element and not the text? And that is where we have to use the box shadow. So let's just write the box shadow this way. And then we're just gonna copy this value right here because it's the same thing. Even though it has some other interesting values, we just want to make things simple over here for the time being. So let's head back to the browser and perform a refresh. So as we can see, we now have some sort of shadow around this. And this is really making the entire thing look a lot real than it used to be previously. What if we just change that thing to black? and see how well black looks on the page. Refresh and we have a very nice looking shadow behind this entire thing. Okay. Isn't this beautiful? Now the next question is what if we want to change the direction of the shadow? What if we want the shadow to move inward instead of it moving away? Okay. To do that, first of all, I want to increase the shadow distance. Then refresh this and see, okay, so we have more shadow now. But what if I want to change the direction of the shadow? I just have to first set this into the, give it an insert value and then head back to the browser and perform a refresh. So as we can see, the shadow has moved inward inside of the element. And this is what we are going to use to get a nice glass looking effects. So that is pretty much it for this video. I'll see you in the next video. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the top video in this series. In this video, we're going to talk about CSS positioning, how we can position an element on the page using CSS. Now, as you can tell from my new setup, I have another div called the second div and it has the content, I'm the second div. And also I have that div selected with some styles that look a little different from the previous style that we have for the first div. Now the only difference here is that the color for the box shadow is red in this case and we have black for this one. So let's go ahead and refresh and see what happens. Okay, so this is what we have on the page. Now as you can see that we have some space in between this, right? To do that you use the margin top property and that is what we have here. Okay, we have a margin top of 100 pixel for the second division and that is why we have a very wide space in between the two divs. But then by default, these two elements have been positioned to be static on the page, meaning that they have to move in the flow of the document. What does that mean? It means the first div must show or must come before the second div. And that is what it means by items being static on the page. They follow some order. But what if we want to move out of the flow of the document, but we don't actually want to be using margin top and margin left and all that to move the element on the page. That calls for something we call CSS positioning. To do that, all we have to do is to add the position property to our style, and then we position it the way we want to. Now we have some number of position values. It can be static, it can be absolute, it can be fixed, and it can be relative on the page. We have already talked about elements being static on the page. Now the next thing I want us to talk about is elements being absolute. If I positioned an element to be absolute this way, I can now move it on the page by setting its left or moving it by the left, right, bottom, or top property. What did this do? When I set the left property to say 30 pixel, see what happens on the page when I refresh. It, you can see that the element is now moving away from the left by 30 pixel. 
and that is what it means by setting the left or the right or whatever property that you are using just remember that whatever you specify it's going to move away from that direction but let's get a little deeper into the absolute position now when you position an element to be absolute in essence what you are doing is that the movement or later on when you set the left or right property it is going to move this element away from the next positioned ancestor okay so meaning if this right here had some sort of positioning okay so maybe if i went ahead to set this or position this one too but in this case i'm just going to give it relative this way and then i set the second div to be absolute the left right bottom or top measurement that i'll give will take effect with respect to this element that I've, i'm using as my reference that is what it means to position an element to be absolute simply all specified left top and right measurement would be moving away from the positioned element or the positioned ancestor now as we can also see that we have positioned this to be relative it means that when we begin to set the bottom left top or right properties the measurement should take effect from the normal position where the element will have been on the page with the the default position that it comes with so it's just going to position it relative to its normal position as in this case this place so let's go ahead and set some top properties and see what happens top value to 50 pixel and see what happens it moves it away from the top by 50 pixel now i'm going to change this right here to fixed and explain what the fixed means with a fixed position what happens is that the element is going to remain at the place that we have positioned it meaning that later even if we begin to scroll the page it's going to remain at the position that we have set it to because it's a fixed element on the page so normally you will see some headers or some nice looking banner on top here and then it doesn't move it stays fixed even though you can move the scroll bar having the other content on the page moving up or down that very element does not move on the page so basically that is about it for the css positioning remember if you don't understand anything you can send me a message you can ask me and i will explain it is very important for you to give reviews okay it's important to me but if you have reviews to give based on something you don't understand it's good you first ask for explanation before you give a review that could have easily been addressed. So thank you very much for joining me in this video. I'll see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to the third video in this series where we are going to take a look at how to create custom fonts for our web development projects using CSS. Now, but before we begin creating the font, I want us to change the default font that comes with this div item. So let's head back to our CSS section of the document. Grab the div as usual. And then we are going to change the font family to Varadana. And we'll head back to our browser and perform a refresh. So as we can see that the font has changed as usual. But then, what if we want to use a font that is not currently present in our system? Before we can do something like that, then we have to create the font in the system. How do we do this? We do this by using the at font face rule, which comes in CSS. Now, the at font face rule takes certain parameters. And the first is font family, the name that we want to give to the font that we are creating, which in this case, I would call nice font. Then the second parameter is the source of the font, where we're going to find the font or the directory where we can locate the font. Now it's a URL, which we can pass to the parameter this way by following where our fonts can be found in the project. So as you can see that I'm currently in my CSS folder and I would have to come back once to my fonts folder in order to find the file called nicefont.otf. So I'm just going to do that by moving back once then I move to the fonts folder followed by the font called nicefont.otf 
this way. Now that we are done creating the font, we want to change the font from Varadana to the nice font that we have created. So let's head back to the browser and perform a refresh. So as we can see that upon refresh, we have the font change into the new font that we have created. And judging from the final project that we are going to build, we can see that the fonts on the tab correspond to the fonts that we've just created. But the problem is sometimes you may not get that luxury in all the browsers. As we can see that the normal version of Firefox is not changing the font for us. And if we decide to use the inspect element tool, which helps us to debug our code and has so many features that will come in very handy when you are developing, especially when you start programming. When we head to the console, we can see that there is an error message here saying that the font cannot be downloaded. And this is because of some strict policy that the browser comes with. It does not really permit cross domain downloads. So what we have to do is just to turn it off. Now in my CSS document, you can see that I have some comment here. So the first thing I want to do is copy this here and then I'm going to move to that directory. I'll be careful and promise. Then I want to search for a configuration. Copy that, that is the next comment. Paste it, enter. And as we can see that this value, its value has been turned to true. So all that we have to do is to just turn this off to false this way head back to the section of the document and then perform a refresh. Now we have the new font showing in this browser as well. So that is pretty much it for creating fonts or custom fonts in CSS. All that you have to remember is that you first begin with the at font phase declaration, then you specify a name for the font. Then the next thing is the URL where the font can be or the font file can be located. Once you're done with that, you can go ahead and use the font throughout your entire development. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye. Hello, and welcome to the 14th video in this series. In this video, we are going to learn how to use a reset style sheet. Now, the purpose of a reset style sheet is to remove things like patterns and some other default styles that come with HTML elements. For me to demonstrate this, I'm going to use some number of list items. So first I'll start with my unordered list block and then I'm going to use the first list item. When I perform a refresh, I can see that this comes with a bullet point. Now this is a default style that comes with it. But default styles do not come with only the list item. They come with almost every HTML element. So what we want to do before we even design the entire project or we start with the glass footer is we want to remove all the default styles that come with the HTML element. And the way that we can do that is by the help of a style sheet that someone has already created. And then I have decided to name my reset.css, which I've included in my CSS folder. So all that I'm going to do is to copy this link that we have for the first style sheet, and then we paste it again. By this time around, we are going to change the directory or the file name to reset.css. Now, when we perform a refresh now, we should see that all the default styles, as in the padding, the margin, and the bullet points have been removed from the list item. And that is pretty much what the reset style sheet does. If we take a closer look at the reset style sheet, which we can open this way, we can see that it's just a selection of all the elements, and then first it sets their margin to zero, padding to zero, and some other important properties. So that is just about it for this video. I'll see you in the next video where we would actually start coding the glass footer. We will begin with the HTML section of the glass footer, which later we will finish with the CSS section. So thank you very much and I will see you. Bye. Hello and welcome to the 15th video in this series, where we're going to take a look at how to set up our file structure for the development of the glass footer. Now, as you can see from my left panel, that we have our main glass footer files folder. And in this folder, we have our CSS folder, which has two CSS files, a reset file, and then the style.css file. Then the next folder is a fonts folder, which has our nice font. Then we have an images folder with our background. And then we have our projects file, which we have directly in the glass footer files folder. Now the next file that I want to create is 
the index file or the index page, the HTML document that is going to hold our glass footer. And I'll be using the advanced new file plugin by holding down Control Alt and N. Then I type index.html. Enter. And then we can see that this file has been created for us. But then what we have to know is that this file is directly in the glass footer files folder. And that is exactly where I want it to be. You can create a folder and put it in, but I prefer to leave it at this place. Now that we are done with the file setup, the next thing I want us to do is to declare a document type and then we are going to change the title of the page to glass footer. With that out of the way, the next thing is that we are going to link our style sheets and the first is the style.css. Now, why is it that we are not moving back but we are just moving forward? And this is because these HTML document that we are working in is not in a folder so we do not have to move back before we can find the CSS folder. Instead we just have to move one step up into the CSS folder and find the file called style.css. Now I'll just copy this right here and then I'm going to repeat it on the page to link my reset style sheet. And the name of the reset style sheet is reset.css. Also, we can choose to bring the type of the file, which is CSS or which is text on CSS. To make good use of our HTML commenting, I'm just going to go ahead and comment what we're actually doing here. So the first comment is a link to the style.css file. And then this one is a link to the reset CSS file. So now that we have our file set up and everything in place, we are going to begin with coding the HTML section of the glass footer. And we will begin that in the next video. So I'll see you and thank you very much. Bye. Hi and welcome to the system video in this series. In this video, we are going to begin coding the HTML section of the footer. So as we can see right here, all these things that we have here or the tabs are list items. Okay, and then this whole thing is a footer tag that we have styled to look this way. So first thing that we are going to declare in the body tag is a footer. Then in the footer, we begin with our UL element. And then there are several divisions. Although we can use the list items and then we style them to look this way. I'm going to use div element and then I will use list items for these things right here or this option buttons. And then I'm going to use list items for the notification icons too. So let's get right into it. Now the first division is the home tab as we can see right here. So we're just going to code that in. And then because the home tab links us to a resource, it's going to contain a link. And then that will come with an anchor tag, which links us to the home page. Okay, in this case, or for this footer, because we are not actually using it in any project yet, it is going to link back to itself. And to do that, all that we have to do is to append this hashtag right here. And then we give it the name home tab or the home button like so. Now, when we head back to our browser and perform a refresh, we can see that we now have a link tag that has the home description. Okay. So we have a div and then the div has an anchor tag within it, which holds the description home. And the div is also in a UL tag. Now the next division, okay, f judging from the final project, the next division that we have is the calculators tab. But then the calculators tab is not a link. So we are not going to use an anchor tag here. All that we have to do is to declare some number of list items because these things that we have here are list items. But first of all, this description or the name that we have here as in calculators is a span. So we're just going to go ahead and code that in. 
like so, then we put the name calculators. Now that we are done with this fun, this same div has another division in it. As we can tell from here that we have another div which is our calculator list division. So we are going to code that one too. And then it is going to contain some number of list items, just like how we have the options here. And then to be precise, it has three list items. So let's just go ahead and code the list items in the div. Now, if you are an Emmet user, I want to show you some cool trick here. If I enter li, which stands for list item, and then I multiply it by three this way, upon tabbing on the keyboard, I get three different list items. And that is so quick, right? If you really want to get into complicated ways of expanding your code using Emmet, you can equally visit their website and learn everything about it. So the first list item is going to hold the description compound money followed by calculate auto loan. Then we have mortgage calculator. So let's just go compound money. Auto loan calc. Then the last one is mortgage calc which I'm very sure that would differ depending on the project we are working on. Because this whole footer is an extract from a different course, it's actually a glass footer or an options tab for a financial software. It has these calculators where you can co compound your money, you can uh, perform auto loan calculation and then mortgage calculation. Now that we are done with the calculator list division, the next div or judging from the the work itself the next div is the display notice tab okay so we're just going to go ahead and then work with the display notice tab now what we have to note is that the display notice tab is not within this div right here it's in another div right or a division on its own and also it has the longest width ever of all the divs that we have so the name is display notice Now that we are done with the display notice, the next thing that we are to work with or the next tab is the notifications tab. But before we even do that, I just want us to perform a quick refresh and see how our code is looking at this moment. As we can see, because we do not have CSS style in it, this is how it looks without CSS. It looks very raw, right? It doesn't look pleasing, but we will get into making it pretty just in a GFE. So our new div, which in this case is going to be the notifications tab and it also equally has three different list items this this and this now but a cool thing that we can notice from here is that this list items do not have a name but instead they do have images to represent them right here so this is a function of a new tag that we have not yet studied and is the image tag the image tag in html has only an opening tag but it doesn't have a closing tag so let's just go ahead and work with an image tag in html F because these are icons i want us to go ahead and create a new folder called icons in this folder th that we have or the images folder that we already have so holding down ctrl alt and n we can navigate to the images folder and then we want to create a new folder called icons like so so images folder, we have a new folder called icons. Now I'm just going to go ahead and then copy some icons into this area. So I'm back now and you can see that I have three different images. I have the drop, I and upload icons. Now they are all PNG files. So to declare an image, we use the IMG description and then we specify the source of the image and give it a name or an alternative name that would display in case the system could not find the resource at the location that we have specified. So what we have to do now is just to move into the images folder. Then the next is the icons folder. And the first icon judging from the final work is the upload icon right here followed by the I and the last one is the drop. Now these icons you can change to suit your setting or specification but for the purpose of this course these icons work really well let's just go ahead and do that now the first one i want to pick is the upload icon 
So I'm just going to write its name as upload.png and then write, give it an alternative test, say upload image. Now that I'm done with this, let's go ahead and refresh and see whether it's working. Okay, so as we can see that we now have an image right here. So the next image is the eye image right here. Let's go ahead and quote that in. I'm just going to go ahead and copy all this because we, I don't want to write <laughs> too much. So I'll paste this right here and then I change the name to the eye. I'll, and I, I'll just go ahead and copy this as well. Paste this right here and change the name to drop. And I have to also change the names as well. So this will be my eye and this will be drop. Okay, so let's just perform a refresh and see what happens. So as we can see, we have our three icons, right? Now from the finished project, we can see that the final tab is the logout tab and it's also a div. So let's just go ahead and code that in real quick. Now, because this div links to a resource or a logout resource, a logout.php file in most cases, what I want to do is put this text in a span and then the inside the span will be an anchor tag which will hold a link. So in the div, I'm going to input a span and then in the span will be an anchor tag which links to nothing in this case and then it will have the description logout. So that's done. Let's just go ahead and perform a quick refresh. So it's good to know that we have all the Ds on the page and then we are actually done with coding the HTML section. The next video, what we'll be taking a look at is how to uniquely identify what we have coded here so that we can use CSS to select them and style them uniquely. Thank you very much and I'll see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to the 17th video in this series where we are going to uniquely identify the elements in the HTML document so we can style them in the CSS section of the project. I hope you really remember what we said about IDs and classes from our previous videos. If you don't, I would advise you visit that video for more clarification. And the first element we are going to identify with an ID is the footer tag. And then we're going to give it glass footer as the identification. Now the next div would have the ID of home tab, like so, because it's a tab on the page. As we can see from here, it's this is the home tab, followed by the calculator tab, display tab, notifications tab, and then we have the logout tab. So the second div has the ID of calc, calc tab, just this way. Then this has an ID of calculator list tab, okay, or just the calc list. The next one right here is the display tab. And then we have the notifications tab, all belonging to different IDs. With all these tabs uniquely identified, the last one is the logout tab. Now, even if we head back and perform a refresh, nothing would happen because we have not specified any style for the IDs yet. But then we can also tell that some of the tabs on the page have the same styles, right? Like this tab looks like this and this one also looks like this. So there's going to be some general classes like for example a class called tab where all those class or elements that belong to that class would have the transparency or the background transition that comes with all tabs, okay? And then also all the elements that belong to the class tab would have the same type of positioning and some other general CSS properties like font size and all that. So let's just go ahead and give the elements their respective classes as well. Now since the footer is only one on the page and is unique, we are not going to give it any class because with the ID we can actually do what we want to do with it. Now but then for the home tab, it's going to have a class of tab 
followed by the calculator tab which also has a general class of tab. One thing to know is that the calculator list tab does not belong to the class tab. Now let's verify that. Just imagine we gave a general style, say font family, where we have nice fonts for all the tabs. But then look right here and see that the font family for the calculator list item is not nice font. It is Verdana. So that we just distort our CSS styling. And for that reason, we can equally tell that this right here does not belong to the class tab. Now, but then for the list items, we are going to give them both IDs and then we are going to give them classes as well for different purposes or for different style purposes. So since this is the compound money option, the ID is going to be compound calc or compound calculator in full. But I'm just going to short this and make a calc. Now, but then with what I have as classes, I want us to leave that for now and finish with the IDs because the classes that I have for the the, the calculator options are helper classes. Okay, I'll explain that later. So let's just continue with the IDs. And then this will be auto loan calc because this is the auto loan calculator button. And then the last one will be mod gauge calc. Now with this out of the way, the next thing I want us to give a class to is the display tab, which belongs to the class tab. And then the notifications tab will also belong to that same class called tab, leaving the logout button belonging to the same class called tab as well. So let's just recap what we covered in this video so that we will meet in the next video for the lesson on helper classes. Now we uniquely identify the element here so that we can use our CSS to style them. And then we gave some IDs and classes whilst others didn't get classes for very good reasons. So that said, I'll see you in the next video. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to the 18th video in this series, where we are going to take a look at the helper classes that we talked about previously. Now, these helper classes are just general classes that I created to add things like pad and top, remove borders, and all that. So let's just go ahead and give the tabs the appropriate classes. Now we're going to begin with the home tab, which we're going to give a class called add padding top. Now even the name of the class itself is self descriptive in nature because you just get to know that we are going to add a padding top with this general class. So let's go ahead and copy this class. And then we are going to give it to the second tab, which is our calculator tab. Now, what you have to know about using multiple classes is that to use more than one class on an element, you just have to separate the name of the classes with just a single space, okay, or a space. Now that the calculator tab also has a class, let's go on to this list items or the calculator options. This right here, we're going to give the class of border bottom button. Just like so, border bottom button btn. And also we want to give another class called calculator list item height. And because all these list items belong to the same class, all would have the same styles. Let's just go ahead and copy this entire class block and repeat it for the two remaining list items. Now moving on to the display tab, we are going to give it the class at padding top, just like so. However, our notifications tab would have only in class tab and then it will have no at padding top class to it. But then the list items here are going to have some general classes which in this case would be two different class. First one will be called the notifications. And then next class will be tab. And because they are all list items that are going to perform or do the same thing, I'm just going to copy the class and repeat it a couple of times, just like so. Now the last class will be given would be on this logout tab division. And then the class will be called logout. But because it is also a tab, we are going to give it the add padding top class. 
Now that we are done adding the helper classes or the classes that will help us to add additional functionalities to the list items using CSS, we are going to end this video here where we will be meeting in the next video to begin with our style sheet where we are going to change the look of this static page that we can see here to something that looks cool like this thing that we can see here. So that is just about it and thank you very much. But before I leave, I want to sound a word of caution. Before your code can or your styles would really pick this thing here, I am urging you to actually look through this and make sure that your codes look just like how they are over here. If you have a mistake here, then the styles that I would be writing may not necessarily be what you have to write or you would have to figure out the mistake that you made. So I'm going to leave or I'll give you this project file so that you can always come back to this and refer to what we did here that maybe you have done wrong. All right, thank you very much. Let's meet in the next video. Bye. Hi, and welcome to the 19th video in the series. In this video, we are going to begin styling the HTML document to actually get that glass finish or the glass footer that we are working towards. So the first thing that we want to do is to set a background to this whole thing right here. So, and in order to do that, first we have to select the element that we want to apply the background to, which in this case is our entire body. And the property of the body that we want to change is background image. Now, next we want to give a URL where we can find this image. So, first of all, because we are in the CSS folder, we want to move back once and then we move to the images folder where we can find the file background.jpg. Let's head back to the browser and perform a refresh. Well, it looks like I have an error in my code. As you can see that because of this simple error, the image is not coming or the image is not appearing. So let's just go ahead and correct this thing right here. Like so, let's head back and refresh. So upon refresh, you can see that we have an image that is the same as the image that we have with our original footer. So the next thing that I want us to do is to remove the default styles that come with the link items or the anchor tag right here. And to do that, we are going to select all the states of the anchor tag. First, the link or the normal link state, followed by the visited state. Then the next thing is the hover state. And then the next state that we are going to work with is the active state. Now, what we want to do is first to take the text decoration or that underline that comes with it. We want to take it away by setting it to none. And then the next thing is the color. We want to change the color to white in all the states. Then finally, we want to display it as a block level element. Now, you remember we talked about inline and block level element. So simply block level elements would show or would appear on new lines whenever they are called into play or action. Let's head back to the index page where we can perform a refresh to see what we've done so far. All right, so as we can see, the styles are working because we selected the right element where we have our logout tab changing color to white and then the home button or the home tab also changes color to white leaving us with no underline at the end of the day because of the text decoration property that was set to none. Next, I want us to create a font, okay, that nice looking font that we will be using. And you remember that to create a font, we first begin with the add font face rule. And then we specify the name of the font by setting the font family property, which in this case I'll call nice font. Then the next thing I want to specify is the source of the font, which is a URL and can be found when we move back once, move into the folder called font, then the name of the font is nicefont.otf. But then I want us to put CSS commenting into a good use here. So we're just going to comment that creating a custom font this way. And now that we are done with the comments right here, now, the next thing that I want us to do is to begin styling the glass footer itself. So we are going to grab the glass footer by ID like this. 
and then the first property that we are going to change is the position we want to make it a fixed position or we want to position it to be fixed on the page so we're going to give it a fixed position and the next thing that we want to do is to set the width to 100% of the entire page then the next thing that we want to do is to bring it to the bottom of the page by setting the bottom value to 0 I just want to be sure that we have the footer running from the left part of the window to the right part so I'm going to set the left property to 0 so there's no space from the left section then I'm going to set the right property to, to 0 so there's no space from the right also now let's go ahead and refresh and see what happens good so upon refresh we can see that the footer has moved to the bottom but from the finished work it looks like whenever our mouse comes into the footer area the mouse point is changing to a form of pointer so that is the next thing that I want us to do to force the mouse to change type we can use the CSS property cursor and then it changes to whatever we specify now in this case I'm just going to change it to a pointer when I head back to the browser and I refresh whenever I move towards the area or the footer area I can see that my mouse has changed accordingly now let's continue with the styles the next thing that I want us to do is to set the height for the footer and we are going to give it 40 pixel let's refresh and see what happens good upon refresh we can see that it looks like some of the elements in the footer are hiding and that is because we are not done with the styling we have not given some of the element with properties and all that so let's continue and see what we can come up with now I want to cast some form of shadow on all the text elements or the text on the footer tab and now I just want to set text shadow and then I'm going to set the horizontal shadow to one pixel vertical shadow to one pixel and then the distance to one pixel and the color will be black so let's go ahead and perform a refresh and see what happens on the page good so upon refresh you can see that there's some sort of black teen shadow behind all the text elements on the page so let's continue styling the footer tab now before I continue any further I want to give a background so that we can see things more officially and then this background will have an RGBA value so that I can control its transparency but then it's going to be black in color so the, prop the values will be 0, 0, 0 and then the transparency value will be 0.25 or 0 0.25 let's head to the browser and see what happens good so as we can see we have a form of flat border on the page with the background of black so why is it that this doesn't look quite real or it doesn't look like the one that we have here now this looks like a 3d image or it looks a little real because we have a lot of multiple shadows casted onto the footer itself and that is what we are going to do in the subsequent codes to make sure that we get that property also but before we do that we can see that there is a thin black line on top of the footer and that is the border top of the footer element so let's go ahead and give the same footer or the new footer we're working on we're going to give it the border top property also so we're going to set border top and then it's going to be a fine line with one pixel size and then it's going to be solid and we are going to give it the color black let's head back and refresh good so upon refresh we can see that we have a thin black line on top of the footer now let's continue with the style and make the footer look a little bit real we want to use box shadows to make it look just like the one that we have already created so we are going to begin with the box shadow the keyword is box shadow and then because we do not want the shadow to move outside the footer area but instead we want it to be casted within the footer we are going to use the insert keyword then we are going to set the horizontal distance to zero for the first shadow and then the vertical distance will be one pixel then we are going to give it an RGBA color which is basically white but then we will make it a little bit transparent 
The first one will have a transparency value of 0.3 or 0.3. So let's just head to the browser and see what we have done so far. When we perform a refresh, we can see that the footer is beginning to look a little real or a little bit real because we now have a very thin shadow casted on top right here. And that is the power of the box shadow. So let's continue using multiple shadows. Now to use a multiple shadow, all that you have to do is to separate the shadows with a comma. So I'm just going to copy this and then I'll be tweaking the values accordingly. Now in the second shadow, we are going to maintain the keyword insert and then the horizontal shadow will also be zero pixel. But a vertical shadow this time would be 10 pixel and then the transparency will be 0.2 this time round and not 0.3. So let's go ahead and perform a refresh and see what happens on the page. So upon refresh, we can see that we have a more solid or more real image. Let's continue styling with multiple shadows. A new comma, then we're going to paste the old shadow and tweak the values accordingly. Now for the third shadow, the insert keyword will still remain. The very first property will be zero, but the second property we're going to give 10 pixel. And this time round, we are going to give it a distance or a shadow distance. Now after the shadow distance, we are going to change the transparency value to 0.25. Now let's go ahead and refresh and see what we have now. Upon refresh, we can see that, that there is a more bigger shadow, white shadow casted on the entire footer. So let's continue with the last shadow. We're going to paste as usual and then we'll be tweaking the values. The insert keyword will still be maintained, but then we are going to change this right here to be negative 15 pixel. And this corresponds to the vertical shadow. Why are we setting this to negative and not positive? Now, if positive moves something in the forward direction, then it means that the negative is just going to move it in the opposite direction. And that is exactly what we want. And we are going to leave the transparency value just like how it is. Now, after we've set this to negative 15 pixel, I want us to give it a distance of 30 pixel. Let's head back and perform a quick refresh and see what happens. Good, so we can see that now the border or the box shadows are well in place and we can equally tweak this to suit our specifications. You can make it more darker and we will be getting into that later in the video. But then for now, from the finished work, we can see that the fonts are not really white. It is when we hover on them that they tend to white. So they are more like a grayish color. So let's just go ahead and give it that color. So we are going to set the color property and then we are going to give it an RGB color with values 208, 208 and then 208. Let's head back and perform a quick refresh. Good. So upon refresh, we can see that the color or the text shell colors have changed to suit our specification. Now with this out of the way, I'll see you in the next video. Thank you and bye. Hi and welcome to the 20th video in the series where we are going to do a lot of great stuff. The first thing that I want us to do is to perform a very quick fix right here. Now this UL tag, I want us to give it an ID of Futa menu. When we head back to the CSS section, we can grab this by ID. And then we are just going to give it a width of 100% of the entire page. Now, after the width, we are equally going to give it a height of 40 pixels. So as you can tell, the values are actually corresponding to that of the glass footer itself. And then the UL tag actually holds the other tabs on the glass footer. So let's perform a refresh and see if there's any significant change. All right, so we can't see anything at the moment. But with feather styles, we can actually see that that is going to help. Now the next thing that I want to do is to begin styling the other tabs. But the first tab that I want to work with is the calc tab. However, you might have the question that why is it that we have home tab before calculators tab? And I have chosen to style the calculators tab before the home tab. 
It is because CSS doesn't have it as a strict policy to work in any specific order. So I can write this here and then it, it will work just fine. I can decide to bring it on top and it works just fine. Basically CSS is not a programming language. So it doesn't obey that top to bottom kind of compiling sort of thing. So with the calculator tab, the first thing that I want to do is to set a left property. And then I'm going to set this thing to be 102 pixels. So in essence, I want the calculator tab to move 102 pixels away from the left part of the page, depending on the kind of positioning that I'm going to give. Now, if I went ahead to refresh, this is not going to take effect because I've not yet set the type of positioning that I want to use. And the reason being that I want to set the type of positioning in a class called tab, which would then apply to all the other tabs on the page. And since I do not have that class yet, the position left property will not take effect. So the next thing that we want to do is to give it a specific width, which would be 150 pixels in this case. Let's refresh and see if that one works. Okay, that one too is not showing, but if we continue to style, we would eventually see them taking effect. Now, taking a look at the document structure, we can see that after the calculators tab is another tab called the calculator list tab. And if we want to see that visually, we can see it from here where we have this tab or where we have this whole thing as a calculator tab or where we have this whole div with the ID of calculator list. So let's go ahead and grab the calculator list div and begin to style it. Now, before we go ahead and write our first style, what we would notice with the finished work is that the calculator list by default is hidden. It's not showing until we hover on this. So that is what we want to set. And it is done with the display property where we're going to set it to none. This is going to hide the calculator list from the page. Let's go ahead and perform a refresh. Look right here as I perform the refresh and see that the amount of content or the content we have here will reduce. So as you can see, we've hidden this. But because I want us to see what is actually happening as we work, I'm going to block this or I'm going to just set this as a comment so that it does not affect the style for now. And it will be showing until we are done with styling the whole calculator list. A cool thing that we can do in order to help us see visually what is happening is to set a background property. So we're going to give this a background and then we are going to give it an RGBA color, which would be black in this case, zero, zero, but will be transparent to 0.6 or 0 0.6 transparency. Let's go ahead and refresh and see. Okay, so now we have that whole thing with the background property. So the next thing that we are going to do is to give it a specific width. And this width will be of value 180 pixel. After giving it a width, I want us to set a padding. Now you know what a padding does. A padding just gives some space around the internal content of the element itself. So the padding value in this case will be five pixels. Let's go ahead and perform a refresh and see how the codes are working. Well, as you can see that because we have broken the code, because of that semicolon that is not here, the codes and the remaining codes are not working. So let's just give this semicolon back to where it belongs and then perform a refresh. So we can see that now we have a width and then we also have a background. The next thing I want us to do is to set some border or give a, a very thin black border around this as we can see with the final work that there is some thin black border around this thing and this border is just one pixel and it's solid in nature which has a color of black let's perform the refresh and see if this works fine all right so we have it now now for the calculator list i want to position it so that we can move it now i'm going to position it absolute to its normal position so if we went ahead to give it a bottom property of 48 pixel, I'm expecting this to move up on, on top of the footer. Now, but what we can see is that it's moving down and that is because the footer is just 40 pixel or uh, is 400 pixel, while this is 48 pixels. 
but just imagine if we reduce the height of the footer to 40 pixels then we can equally have this sitting on top of the footer like how we have it right here one thing we can notice about the list items here is that the font differ from all the other fonts right here and this font is of type Verdana that is what we want to set next so the font family will be set to Verdana perform a refresh and then we are expecting to see a font change so as you can see that upon refresh we have a font change now you can go a little bit creative choosing your own font that will look more pretty and I'll be very very happy if you share with me after you have finished the project the way you've been able to tweak it to meet your standards I'll be very excited to see your version of the footer if for whatever reason your fonts are not starting or the text are not starting at the left part of the their respective container as in this case what you can do is to set the text alignment to left and this will push them to the left part of the container because I already have it maybe because of the reset style sheet this code would not actually do anything but let me just keep it right there now the last thing that I want us to do on this calculator list division right here can be seen from the final project where we have the top corners looking a little curved this we can achieve by the border radius property but we are going to specify the actual position for the radius to take effect so in this case it should be the top right radius and then we have the top left radius also let's just go ahead and do that so we're going to set the border top right radius and this we're going to set to 5 pixel now we're just going to copy this and repeat it but this time we are changing this to left 5 pixel also let's go ahead and refresh and see what happens on the page so upon refresh we can see that we have that rounded corners here as well just like how we have it in the finished work so that is pretty much it for this video I'm going to meet you in the next video where we will start styling the other tabs as well thank you very much hi and welcome to the 21st video in this series in this video we're going to continue styling the other tabs but before we begin styling the other tabs as we can see clearly from the calculator list that we have calculator list items as an li items each of a common class what I want us to do with them is to give them a fixed width and the way that we are going to select them is by the use of a descendant selector so first we're going to grab the calculator list then next we're going to grab all the list items that are descendants of that calculator list div so we just want to give them a fixed width of 180 pixels let's go ahead and refresh the browser and see what happens and as we can see not much is really happening now but they have a fixed width of 180 pixels trust me now the next thing that we are going to do is the hover to show effect where we get to hover on the calculator tab and then we get this calculator list div showing itself to achieve that first of all I want us to go back and uncomment this line so that we can have the display to none for the calculator list as we can see by refreshing this then we are going to add that functionality using CSS now the way that we're going to do this is to first select the calculators tab then we are going to grab the hover state or the hover activity of the calculator tab that means when the mouse goes into that area then what we want to do next is to select the calculator list as well and change a few of its properties now we're going to set the display to block meaning that when someone hovers over the tab that is called calculator or calc tab the browser is actually going to change the display property of the calculator list which we had to be none over here and then it's going to set it to block next we also want to change the color to the RGB color where we have 
208208208 as values. Let's just head back to the browser and refresh. And upon refresh, we can see that the star is really taking effect. When we send our mouse over to the calculator tab, we can see that the calculator list is showing right in the bottom right then. Now, because I want these tabs to start responding to the left and right properties, I actually want them to start responding to the positioning. I'm going to go ahead and style that class that we call the tab class. To select a class, we use the period first, then we select the class name, tab. And the first thing that I want to do is to float all the items to the left or the items that belong to the class tab to left. Now, what does this float property do? You remember we said that some elements are block level in the sense that when they occupy a line, nothing can be at the right side or at the left side of them. But if we set this element or this type of elements to be floated to the left, then that means that other elements can also move to their right side. So given this new explanation, let's get back to it and give a position. When we set this to absolute, and then we head back to our browser and perform a quick refresh, I'm expecting some things here to start behaving, right? So the calculator stuff, for example, I'm expecting it to move. Good. So as you can see, the calculator stuff has moved about the number of pixels that we've set it to move away from the left part of the window. Also, I want to change the font to suit or match the font that we have uh, with the finished work. And that font is nice font. So the way we are going to change that is with the font family property. And we're going to set this to nice font. When we head back and perform a refresh, I'm expecting the font to change. So we have it there. Now from the finished work, we can see that there's some sort of thin white line to the right part of these borders. And that is a border right property. So what we are going to do is to set that border right. And then we are going to set it to two pixels this time round. It should be solid in nature, but it's going to have an RGBA color, which in this case would be white but it will come with a transparency value of 0.4 or 0.4. Let's go ahead and refresh this and see. All right, so upon refresh, we can see that the thin line is beginning to show, but it's not really showing properly as of now because of the other styles that we've not included yet, but we'll get to it in a short time from now. Now, from the finished work, we can see that the text elements are in the center of their containing element. So to do that, we're just going to use the test align property and set it to center. Let's head back and perform a quick refresh. So upon refresh, we can see that the text has moved to the center of its containing div. Now from the finished work, we can see that whenever we hover on a tab, we can see some sort of smooth appearing black or thin black background coming in. Now this we can achieve by the use of CSS transitioning. To make an element transition or a property of an element transition, we first begin by the transition keyword, which has vendor prefixes. What does that mean? It means that some browsers may not actually recognize this word transition. So you have to give it a prefix. This very prefix is for Opera type browsers and this is for Chrome WebKit. But as of this development, all the browsers that I am using here respond to the transition property without a prefix. So I'm just going to go ahead or to make things easier. I'm going to keep this to as comment for you just in case your browser does not recognize the actual one or the, the one that we will be using. Now, the thing that we want to transition upon Hoover is the background. And then we want to do that over the period of one second, the time that it should take for the transition to complete. Now, when we even head back and perform a refresh, we are not going to see that working because we have not set a value for it to transition to. But then let's just go ahead and give this a height for the time being, which will be 40 pixel, just to match the height of the entire footer. So as we can see, the height property has actually taken effect where we have the tabs responding to the height as in the final project right here.
Now, the next thing that I want us to look at is how we can set the hover property for the tabs or the class called tab so that whenever we hover on this, we can have the color of the text changing to white and also we can have the background changing to that light black background that we see on the final footer. So let's just go ahead and grab the tab again. Then we are going to set a hover state for it. This way, we give it a background value which will be RGBA because we want an alpha channel. It should be black in nature. However, we want to make it transparent to a certain value of 0 0.3. Let's perform a refresh and see what happens. Upon refresh, now when I hover on this, you can see that the thin black background or the cool looking background is coming into play in an equivalent of one second. Isn't this looking cool? This is looking great. In no time, we would have the finished product. So as we can tell from the finished work, the next thing that we would do on Hover State is to change the color to white. So let's just go ahead and set the color to white. Perform a very quick refresh on this tab right here. And then upon Hover, we can see that the color has also changed to white. This is looking good to me. And I'm guessing it looks good to you too. Now, before we move any further, I want us to just go back and continue styling the other tabs. Because now that we've set the position property, any left or any value that we give would actually take effect for us to see it. The first tab that we are going to style is the home tab in this case. And then we want to give the fixed width of 100 pixel. Let's perform a refresh and see how that works. So we can see that the home tab has actually moved a little bit bigger. Even if we can see it well at the moment, let's just keep on keeping on, but we will see it soon. Now, what we can tell from our HTML document is that the home tab has some anchor tag within it. And that is the next thing that we want to set. First of all, we'll be giving that anchor tag a height of 40 pixel and then we are going to give it a font family to of nice font as well. So we're going to grab the home tab first. And then we are going to grab the A tag that is a descendant of the division home tab. Set the height to 40 pixel. Then we also change the font family to nice font. Let's perform a quick refresh and see how that looks. Okay. It does not actually look like it's showing, but then it's working. So let's continue with the style until we get to a point where we have everything in place. Now, from the finished work, we can see that after styling the home tab, calculator tab, the next tab is the display tab, right? So let's get back to our CSS and grab the display tab. And then the first thing that we are going to do to the display tab is to give it a fixed width of 500 pixel. As we can tell that that is the longest tab ever on the page. Then we are going to move it 254 pixels away from the left part of the window. So let's go ahead and refresh and see what happens. So we have the display tab in place and it's 254 pixels away from the left part of the window. Now with that out of the way, we will continue with styling the notifications tab. So let's head to the CSS part of our document. Then we grab the notifications tab. And then this time around, we are moving the notifications tab away from the right part of the window by 105 pixels. Then we are going to remove the border right. We don't want any white border to be showing at the right part of the notifications tab. So we are setting this to none. Let's perform a refresh and see how this is faring. Okay, so as you can see that that has actually made one notification icon show. Let's get back to work. Now we can see that on Hoover, this thing is having the background property or the background is affecting it too. But from the finished work, we can see that even on Hoover, we do not have any background right here. So we are going to remove that. And to do that, we are just going to grab the notifications tab then we are going to affect the hover state and set the background property to none. Now that we have this done, let's head back to the browser and see something. Upon refresh, we are seeing something that is quite strange. It looks like 
this background or the background is still showing for the notification icon but it has really worked the code we wrote has really worked because we targeted the notifications tab and not the list icons or the icons themselves so if we want to remove that from the icons then we have to be specific enough to attack the icons and not the notifications tab only but before we get into removing the background property from the list icons what I want us to do now is to change certain properties of the notifications list icons so let's just grab it as usual then we grab this and then list item then the first thing that we are going to set is the width we're going to give them a fixed width of 40 pixel each then after which we are going to give them some sort of padding top of 5 pixel now the last thing is that we are going to give them position relative let's head back and see if our code is doing anything at all on the page let's refresh and we can see that the code has indeed worked because we have given this thing some form of width now they are able to fit on the footer itself finally I want us to remove the background from this list items on the hoover state okay so once we are done with that we will end the video here and then we will meet in the next lecture where we continue with things like animating this upon hoover so that they move up a little bit okay so let's just go ahead and grab this list items and set the hoover state to have a background of none hoover then we expect this thing to have a background of none upon hoover let's just go ahead and refresh and see what happens so now when we hover upon this we see that we do not have any background coming into play so thank you very much for joining me in this video I'll see you in the next video bye hello and welcome to the 22nd video in this series in this video we are going to take a look at how we can make these icons move up when we hover on them just like we can see with the finished work where we hover on a notification icon and then the icon moves up so let's get to the CSS section of our work the first thing that we can tell from the notification icon is that each notification list item has a class of notifications so first we will grab the class notifications and then set an animation to its hover state to select the class notifications we begin with the period then the name notifications then what we want to do next is to set what happens on hover so the first thing that we are going to do is to create the animation now what we have to know about CSS animations is that some browsers do not actually recognize the word animation so you may want to prefix it by doing something like this okay now so this prefix is for browsers that have the Chrome type with the WebKit browsers the next one is for Opera type browsers then the next one right here is the normal one but because as of this development this keyword right here is recognized by all the browsers I'm using I'm just going to go ahead and comment this out so that it doesn't affect or it doesn't do anything so the name of the animation I want to give right now will be move up this is a custom name you can use any name then the next thing is the fill mode the way we want the animation to feel on the page whether it should be smooth ease in or ease out all those things so what I want to do is just to set it to be forward then I want to give it an animation duration the time that it will take for the animation to complete and I'm going to set this to 0 0.5 seconds now let's save this and head back to our browser and perform a refresh upon refresh we can see that the animation is not taking effect and that is because we have not yet set what would happen at various instances in the life of the animation so let's go ahead and do that using CSS keyframes to use the CSS keyframes we specify the keyword keyframes and if you are a regular user of animation softwares like Adobe After Effects you will know what keyframes are keyframes just specify what happens at any moment in time of an animation 
So say at keyframes on the animation move up, at 0% in the life of the animation, what I want to do is that I want to keep the margin top to 0. I think the margin top should, shouldn't do anything. But when it's 100% in the life of the animation, I want to set the margin top to negative 10 pixels. Now, why am I setting it to negative and not positive? The idea is we want it to move in the opposite direction. So if margin top is supposed to move an element to the bottom, then if we negate the value, it's going to send it upward. So let's go ahead and perform a quick refresh and see if the code is working just fine. All right, so as we can see that our code is working just fine, like how we have it in the final project. So with that out of the way, I will see you in the next video where we are going to start the logout tab. Thank you very much and bye. Hi and welcome to the 23rd video in this series where we are going to take a look at how to start the logout tab. So let's get straight to the CSS section of our work or our document. Then the first thing we want to do as usual is to first grab the logout tab. And then we are going to give the logout tab a width of say 107 pixel. Then next we want to move it from the right section of the page by one pixel. Then next we want to give it a, a unique font because as we can see that the font of the logout tab is different from all the other tabs and the font in this case is Vardana. So let's go ahead and just confirm that. Okay, We can see that the logout font here looks different from all the other fonts on the tab because this font is Vardana whereas, whereas this font that we have here was created by us. Now I want to set a button right property to none. Why am I doing this? We can see that as of now all the elements that belong to the class tab do have some border rights to it, this thin line over here. But we don't actually want a border right on the logout tab. So by setting it to none, we would have removed it from the tab. Now let's go ahead and perform a refresh and see if our code is working. So upon refresh, we can see that the logout tab is beginning to fall in place. Now from the HTML section of our document, we can see that the logout tab has a span which is also holding a logout description or logout text. Let's head back to the finished work and see something. When we hover on the logout tab in the finished work, we can see that the logout text turns red and then it moves up a little bit. So let's go ahead and code that in the CSS section of our project. But before we begin writing anything here, let's go ahead and look at the classes that we have on the logout tab. The logout tab also belongs to a class called logout. So instead of using the logout tab ID, we can equally use the class logout to do the same thing. So let's get into it and use the class logout. Now we're going to affect the hover state of the logout. So when you hover on the logout tab, I want to grab that span and then first I'm going to position it to be relative. So the question is why am I positioning this relative and not absolute? Now I'm doing so because if you remember the lecture on CSS positioning, we said that when you position an element relative and you use the left, right or bottom properties, what happens is that it moves the or the movement, the measurement is taken from the normal position of the element. Whereas if you use the absolute positioning, it measures it from the nearest positioned ancestor. So in this case, for the hover or the little displacement that we will be given to the logout text, the right positioning to use is relative positioning. So I'm going to give it button value of 3 pixel. And then save this, head back, perform a refresh and see what happens. Now you can see that when we hover on this, the text is moving up a little bit. So let's go ahead and do some more cool stuff to wear. Now the next thing I want to do is that anchor tag within the span that 
is contained in the logout div. I want to give some width and some positioning properties to you, that anchor tag to you. So first I'm just going to grab my logout tab like so. Then next is the anchor tag within it. And what I want to do is first to give it a height of 40 pixel. Then next I'm going to set a width for it also which will be equivalent to the width of the logout tab itself 107 pixel then the next thing I'm going to do is to set the display to block so that this way the logout tab would also behave like a block level element which in essence will make it work very well with the float properties now let's head to the browser and perform a refresh and see what happens okay well since nothing much is happening here let's continue to do some feather styling but from the finished work we can see that the color changes to red so let's go ahead and just code that and at this point I'm very much confident that you can do this on your own but I'm just going to help you to do it anyway so we are going to grab the logout tab then on hoover we want to effect the anchor tag and all that we want to do is to set the color to red now remember that you are supposed to grab the anchor tag. The text is within the anchor tag, so you have to effect the change on the anchor tag itself. Let's head to the browser and refresh. So as we can see that on Hoover, we are having the text to change or the text changing to red. Now, but in, you remember we talked about some helper classes. So let's go ahead and start working on those helper classes. The function of the helper classes is just to give us things like the height or the border lines that we are going to see on the individual list items when we hover on the calculators tab. And then also we can see that the content here or the text here is close to the top border. Okay, so that padding top or add padding top class that we have created in effect would be pushing this thing down after we finish styling it. So let's go ahead and do that and see what happens. So the first helper class is butter button. And then we are going to set a butter button property where we're going to set a fine line of one pixel and it's going to be solid in nature and the color will be white. So now that we are done with this, let's go ahead and refresh and see what happens. Okay, so we can see that nothing much is happening. That is because we have an error in the code. Okay, and the problem is that the class is butter bottom btn underscore btn just this way. So let's head back and perform a quick refresh and see what happens. So we can see that upon refresh, we are getting some white border lines under the individual list items. So now the next class that I want us to code is the padding top class. So we're going to add padding the this class like so. And then we are going to set the padding top property to 8 pixels. Now you should know that all these values have been pre-calculated. So if this is your first time doing something like this, it's experimental and then you will need to change your course to match every significant improvement until you get it right. But because you have the values already, you may not actually have to be struggling with measurements. Let's go ahead and refresh and see what happens. Now I want you to take a look at the tabs as I perform the refresh. So as you can see that upon refresh the text has moved down a little bit and that is because of the padding top that I've just applied to the tab element or the general class add padding top. So the final helper class is the calculator list item height class like and all that we want to do is give it a height of 20 pixel so let's head back and perform a refresh and see what happens now when I refresh this you will see that there will be more space in this or the height of the individual list items is going to increase so let's perform that and see okay so as we can see that the height of the individual list items has increased the good thing you can do is to play around with this and see what you can come up with I'll be very happy if you shared with me what you've created and please don't forget to keep practicing because practice makes perfect. And thank you very much and I'll see you in the next video 
where we are going to begin wrapping up or finalize everything. Thank you. Bye. Hello and welcome to the 24th video in this series where we're going to fix the rest of the code to actually get the final product. Now the first problem that I want us to fix right here is the logout tab. If we take a look at the background that comes with the logout tab, it looks like the logout tab is entering the notification icon. So what we are going to do is to first reduce the width of the logout tab from 107 pixel to 105 pixel. And also there is some white space or there's a space at the right part of the tab which we do not want. So getting back to our CSS document, scrolling down to the logout tab section, we can change the value of the width to 105 pixel. Then the right property should be zero. Now that we are done with that, let's just go ahead and refresh. So we can now see that it has fixed that problem for us. Now the next thing that I want us to do is to take a look at the border top that property that we have here. It looks like the line that we have on top here is a lot thinner than what we have here. Meaning this line is a lot darker, which we do not want. So let's go ahead and make this a little bit transparent. This setting we can find on the logout tab itself where we set the border top property to be an RGBA color instead of a named color value. This way we can give it the same black but we can control the transparency. So let's give this 0.5 and see. And upon refresh I'm expecting to see a change in that. Now also when we drop this thing back to 40 pixel the look of the background is going to make this look a lot whiter. So what I want us to do is to make it a little bit darker so that when we drop it, the look of the, the background will not affect it that much. So let's go ahead and set the background value or increase the transparency value to make it a lot more opaque. Now, so the next thing I want us to do is to drop the footer back to 40 pixel. And this we can do by changing the code from 400 pixel to 40 pixel. Now, before we drop this, I want us to do a very fun thing. So we are going to count from three to one. And on my count, we will be refreshing the page to drop this footer. So on my count, let's go three, two, one. And there we have it, guys. We have just created the most nicest looking glass footer ever. And remember that you can always tweak this to suit your needs. Now, if you've come this far, I want to say you are very good and you've done really, really well. A lot of people start things that they are not able to finish, but you have started something that you were able to finish. I think you deserve an applause. Clap for yourself. And I will see you in the bonus lecture where we are going to talk about some fun stuff, right? So bye for now. Hi and welcome to the bonus lecture in this course. Now in this lecture we are going to take a look at where we actually derive that glass footer from. Now that glass footer comes with a project that I'm working on. It's a Udemy course and that is the the name of the course is build your first business app. It's supposed to be a financial software we are going to build it from ground up so I'll teach you how to build a financial software business software you do not need to know how to do it and then I'm just going to give you a preview so I can access that by going to my local host to the working directory and then here we have it so it's prompting me to log in now if I don't have login details I can equally sign up for an account which will send me a mail I confirm myself and I can log into the system so let me just log in since I have an account and guys that is it so this is how it looks like and you can see that we still have that glass footer right here we have a panel we can manage to do list we can make transactions we can send mail we can see the total balance that we have in our account. We have a profile picture, profile name, and then we also have some cool toggling features here. You can see that we have the names of the respective notification icons 
coming up when we hover on them. We can also log out from the system or we can just click here to get rid of this if we don't want it. We can equally click here to get rid of it. Now, if you want to use a calculator, too, you can select the calculator that you want to use from here. Now, because these are work in progress, I have not completed work on this app. So I'll, I'll let you immediately I'm done, right? Now, if you want to contact me, you can visit me via YouTube by the name account name LixWeb, where you get some free videos on web development and all that. And also you can meet me on Facebook by sending me a friend request at this name, Linus Heaney. Also, you can like our page, a LixWeb page on Facebook, where we get to share very, very nice info. Now, the next thing is the website. Okay, we will be moving from the WordPress domain to our own domain very soon, where we will be sharing a lot of great stuff. You should do follow us. And also, I have a final word of advice for you. And it's simple. Just don't stop practicing because practice is going to make you perfect. I have built this thing over and over and over and over again before I was able to remember exactly what I have to do at any point in time. So with time and constant practice, you are going to become one of the best designers ever in web development. Thank you very much for taking this course. I'll see you in the next course. It's bye for now.